In 2016, several diplomats, CIA operatives, and their family members began reporting terrifying health problems after hearing a strange sound. All of these people were either American or Canadian, and all of them, at some point, were working or living in Havana. The symptoms of these alleged illnesses were very strange and scary, and no one has yet been able to identify why they happen or where they came from. But over time, more people have began suffering from the symptoms, and its effects have started to reach way beyond the small confines of Havana. The case is one of the world's strangest modern-day mysteries, and includes links to surveillance, espionage, political posturing, and dark and mysterious brain-altering forces. This is the terrifying mystery of the Havana Syndrome. not be under any conditions be an intervention in Cuba by United States Armed Forces and this government will do Relations between Cuba and the US have been tense for a long while. During their patchy past, the two countries have battled and postured over invasions, revolutions, embargoes, and much more aggression and antagonism. From the Bay of Pigs to the Cuban Missile Crisis, to fears about both communism and capitalism, it's been a rough ride. But in 2015, the two countries decided to put their difficult past behind them in an attempt to improve relations. In the same year, the US Embassy in Cuba reopened, re-establishing the Havana base that had been closed since 1961. And all seemed well, until late 2016, when several of its staff began reporting terrifying and bizarre health problems. Their families were also affected, along with CIA operatives and their families. That are new developments in the mystery attack on American diplomats and their families in Cuba, and new cases under investigation. Representatives for those diplomats now claiming some Americans suffered traumatic brain injuries and permanent hearing loss at the U.S. Embassy in Havana. Some were waking in the middle of the night, hearing grinding, blaring, pulsating sounds. Some suddenly felt as if they were driving fast in the back of a car, with pressure mounting in their heads and ears. Others lost the ability to hear properly, while some experienced speech problems. A small few suffered from spontaneous nosebleeds, while others experienced headaches, tinnitus, and balance problems. These attacks usually occurred while the sufferers were in their temporary Havana homes or in their Havana hotel rooms. Sometimes the symptoms were only experienced in specific localized places. Often, for example, sufferers could feel the symptoms while lying in bed, but were relieved of their pain and suffering after walking only a few feet. Most attacks occurred at night, and most lasted for anything between 30 seconds and 30 minutes. The attacks were always accompanied by some sort of noise, but the interpretation of this noise was always different. Some people heard low hums, others heard shrill pitches, and some heard oscillating thumping sounds. Most of the attacks were very intense and overwhelming. One victim, when describing it, said, Quote, it came on very suddenly, in a matter of about seven minutes. I went from feeling completely fine to thinking, oh, something's not right, to being very, very worried and actually thinking I was going to die. I woke up in the middle of the night because I had this incredible case of, of vertigo. It felt almost as if I was in some kind of, you know, carnival ride. And I'll tell you, Catherine, I'd spent years in, in war zones of Iraq and Afghanistan. I'd put my life on the line. This was the most terrifying experience of my life. I had no control. Pressure in the head. Yes. Loss of balance. Yes. 
ringing in the ears. Yes. I mean, I've had a headache for three years. It feels like a vice clamp down here, and then there's pressure that comes over the top of my head. Mark says it took three years to get help at the Walter Reed Military Hospital. But they diagnosed me with a traumatic brain injury. It's on paper. I have it. Over time, U.S. authorities became concerned, eventually removing the sufferers of these symptoms from Havana. But some of the attacks have left the victims with long-term symptoms. One of those affected now allegedly wears a hearing aid full-time. Others have been left unable to recall certain words and can't concentrate for long periods. Some are now unable to focus, struggling to read basic words and text. Sometimes, sufferers forget what they were talking about during conversations, or have no memory of chats they've had only five minutes earlier. So, what caused these symptoms? And why are they only happening to embassy staff, CIA employees, and their families and children? What exactly was happening in Havana? And who was responsible for it? At first, U.S. investigators assumed that the Cuban government was behind the attacks. But in an official statement, they denied any responsibility, claiming, quote, Cuba has never, nor would it ever, allow that the Cuban territory be used for any action against accredited diplomatic agents or their families, without exception. U.S. authorities weren't so sure. In September 2017, non-essential staff were removed from the U.S. Embassy in Havana, along with all family members, while U.S. citizens were instructed not to visit the nation. Some CIA operatives were also withdrawn from Cuba. In 2019, Canadian staff were removed from the Canadian Embassy, after at least 14 staff members reported similar symptoms. Lots of U.S. officials were convinced that their people were being targeted and attacked by Cuban authorities. One said, quote, We don't know the means, the methods, and how these attacks are being carried out. The fact that some of these attacks have occurred in hotels where American citizens could be, we felt we must warn them not to travel to Cuba until we know more about the source and ways to mitigate these attacks. U.S. authorities claimed that at least 21 Americans had, quote, been targeted in specific attacks in Havana. Donald Trump who was president at the time, agreed, saying, quote, I do believe Cuba's responsible. I do believe that. It's a very unusual attack, as you know. But I do believe Cuba is responsible. And it's easy to see why this was the first theory. Historically, there's been a huge amount of harassment between US spies and agents and their Cuban counterparts. Both sides have tried to intimidate and confuse one another, even during recent years of peaceful reconciliation. According to U.S. diplomat Vicki Huddlestone, Cuban authorities have pointed cameras at their homes, keeping them under constant surveillance. They've also broken into their houses, defecating in their toilets, leaving cigarette butts in their ashtrays, and intentionally leaving behind other obvious signs of intrusion. Some speculate that they even tried to poison their pets. But amid all the speculation and controversy, Cuban officials helped U.S. authorities with their investigations. They agreed that the attacks were happening, and they too wanted to find out what was occurring and why. Because they were so willing to help, it would seem that Cuba wasn't responsible after all. Suspicion then fell on rogue Cuban groups. Could these attacks have been orchestrated by Cuban rebels who were angry about the blossoming positive relationship between Cuba and the USA. Other skeptics thought that the whole phenomenon had been contrived and falsified by Trump's presidential team, who were eager to destroy much of the progress made by the Obama administration and Cuba. But if that's the case, how is it possible that some Canadian citizens have also suffered the symptoms? Another unusual theory was pesticides. During the period over which the Havana Syndrome symptoms were being reported, the Cuban government had been spraying lots of insecticides to curb the spread of the Zika virus. 
Some investigators speculated that these insecticides might have caused some of the associated symptoms, but in all honesty, that's highly unlikely. But here's where things get crazy, and where most of these theories fall short. The Havana Syndrome might have started in Havana, but its impact and influence soon moved away beyond Cuba's capital. Cases started popping up in other parts of the world, and most theories and explanations became completely obsolete. The Havana Syndrome soon started spreading way beyond Havana, and U.S. citizens who had never been in Cuba began to experience similar symptoms and effects. In 2018, a female employee at the U.S. consulate in Guangzhou began suffering from almost exactly the same symptoms as those who had been working in Cuba, and after an analysis of her condition, she and at least two more U.S. citizens were removed from China. At a similar time, an employee of Tashkent's U.S. Embassy in Uzbekistan started suffering from the same symptoms. In 2019, a White House official suffered from a similar attack while walking her dog in a Virginia suburb of Washington. Her dog also began seizing up. Another official felt the same shocking symptoms while walking near the White House. While previous attacks in Havana have all happened indoors, these attacks happened outdoors. So it seems that the rules have changed. And these terrifying attacks are no longer limited to homes or hotels. Whoever is behind this can now seemingly do so anywhere. And whoever is being attacked can be attacked anywhere. At least three CIA operatives have experienced these types of symptoms since the 2020 election. And there are now over 100 cases around the world, with many of them unrelated to Cuba or Havana. Similar attacks have happened to other U.S. intelligence personnel in Russia, Poland, Georgia, Australia, and Taiwan. They are becoming more frequent, more widespread, and more scary. And they're receiving more coverage and investigation every day. But how are these attacks occurring? Is it possible that someone is using some kind of weapon that leaves behind no trace? One of the most popular theories is that these symptoms are a result of some form of radio frequencies or electromagnetic pulses. The most common speculation is that microwave energy is the root cause. What could be the cause? After a year-long investigation, 19 top experts from the National Academies of Sciences conclude the most likely explanation, directed pulse microwave energy consistent with the directed radio frequency energy attack. This is not a cell phone. This is not what you see from a microwave oven. This is a very particular and unusual way of delivering microwave energy. Stanford professor of medicine David Relman chaired the study. We have neurologists on our committee that said afterwards, in my entire career of reading about countless hundreds and thousands of cases of neurologic injury, I've never heard of something like this. During the Cold War, American scientist Alan Frey discovered that you could direct microwaves at human heads in order to produce the illusion of sound, even in deaf people. The Soviets found out about Frey's research and flew him to Moscow to learn more. Historically, Russia and the Soviet Union have been very interested in this type of sonic research and how this terrifying mind-altering technology could be applied to warfare. A 1976 report on Soviet research in the microwaves details experiments conducted on animals. In these experiments, microwaves were used to irrevocably damage the brain makeup of mice. Cells and nerves were damaged, and brain function was altered. It's therefore clear that microwave weapons can be used to manipulate bodies and minds. 
And as is often the case in the worlds of warfare, power struggles, and politics, if something can be done, it probably has already been done. But despite all this research, and despite all the people claiming that microwave devices are the root cause of the Havana Syndrome, no devices have ever been found. Investigators searched the homes, hotels, and hotel rooms where these attacks were occurring, but could find no devices and no signs of suspicious activity or interference. Some researchers then began to speculate that the symptoms weren't being created by sonic devices. After undertaking brain scans, investigators discovered that some of the sufferers had physical damage to their brains. And as far as we know, it's impossible to cause physical trauma to a brain by using sound. Brain damage and concussions? It's not possible, said Joseph Pompey, a psychoacoustics expert. Somebody would have to submerge their head into a pool lined with very powerful ultrasound transducers. Another investigator said, There is no evidence whatsoever that this was caused by a sonic device. It is physically impossible to have brain damage caused by an acoustical device. And most of those symptoms are not symptoms of sonic weaponry. Another claimed that the brain injuries were similar to those observed by soldiers struck by roadside bombs on military duty, but seemingly without any sign of impact. In short, the injuries were significant and impossible to overlook but no one had ever seen anything like them. No one could explain the sounds, the trauma, the psychological effects, or any other symptom of the Havana Syndrome. Because of all of this uncertainty, some skeptics have come up with a much different explanation. And it is just as strange, and just as disturbing. So strap yourself in, because this is where things get weird. Some skeptics claim that all of these symptoms are nothing but mass hysteria, much like the dancing plagues, laughing plagues, and other mass delusions that have occurred historically in other parts of the world. Throughout history, there have been many other cases of collective mass hysteria, in which people have exhibited mental and physical symptoms brought on by fear, stress, and panic. And some people believe that the Havana Syndrome can be explained in exactly the same way. For example, in Belgium, 1999, around 100 people reported illnesses after drinking Coca-Cola. But these symptoms of illness were proven to be nothing but a mass delusion. Similarly, in 1962, in the African village of Tanganyika, over 1,000 children were involved in a laughing hysteria in which they couldn't stop laughing for several months. Again, this was proven to be psychosomatic, and was attributed to high levels of stress. In Europe, between the 14th and 17th centuries, there were many dancing epidemics, in which people would dance until they became exhausted or injured, or even until they died. Some experts think these dances were caused by stress or fear, Others believe that many people joined in simply because they didn't want to feel left out. Sound-related symptoms and illnesses have occurred in several places around the world, including England, New Mexico, Ontario, and Indiana. Some people in these places believe they can hear constant sounds, and this belief causes intense physical and mental reactions, both real and imagined. There's even a so-called World Hum database dedicated to finding these hums throughout the world, and providing explanations for why they happen, or at least why people think they happen. These types of mass hysteria episodes usually happen in people who feel stressed, powerless, and worried. And as we've covered, US representatives in Cuba were frequently targeted and attacked by Cuban officials, which would have led to high levels of stress and concern. But what about the evidence of concussions? How can psychosomatic illnesses cause concussion-like injuries to the brain? Well, some scientists believe that this type of physical trauma doesn't always need to occur because of a physical cause. Strangely, 
These types of abnormalities can be seen in brain scans of people with chronic pain, depression, trauma, and other illnesses. So, are the victims really just suffering from mental illness, brought on by their own fear, stress, and paranoia? According to one researcher, that's exactly what happened. Quote, Aside from the reported syndromes, there is no evidence that a microwave weapon exists. And all the available science suggests that any such weapon would be wildly impractical. It's possible that the symptoms of all the sufferers of the Havana syndrome share a single, as yet unknown, cause. It's also possible that multiple real health problems have been amalgamated into a single syndrome. This case is packed with unanswered questions. First, why is the Havana Syndrome only affecting CIA operatives, embassy staff, government representatives, and their families? Why, according to US authorities, have FBI investigators never been given the CCTV footage they asked for? They allegedly requested access to the hotel security footage, but never received any of it. Why are the FBI and the CIA so reluctant to release public information about the case, including the names of the people who suffered. Why do most people involved in the investigations ask to remain anonymous? The CIA and the NSA have been intercepting intelligence and conducting various investigations for a long time, but haven't been able to find any concrete evidence or clues that point to who's to blame. Even now, in 2021, U.S. officials have made these investigations a priority and are still trying to work out how these attacks happened and where they come from. Most of the U.S. now believe that Russian forces are behind the attacks, and there's some evidence to back this up. CIA agents have been using phone tracking technology to monitor the whereabouts of Russian agents who they believe to be involved. During many of the attacks, Russian operatives have been very close to the people experiencing the symptoms. On two occasions, they were in the very same hotel as those who were being attacked. And as already mentioned, Russia and the Soviets have shown interest in this type of weaponry, at least according to online sources. Russia denied these accusations, saying, quote, We sympathize with our colleagues and wish them good health. We believe that it is immoral and low to launch anti-Russian speculations. Fictions about some psi rays are beyond common sense. Because of all the secrecy and uncertainty around the Havana Syndrome, there are lots of theories about what is happening and who is responsible. Perhaps the Havana Syndrome has all been manufactured by Cuba or some group with links to Cuba, or maybe by someone that wants to damage the relationship between Cuba and the USA. Some people even think that the CIA or the FBI are attacking their own people in order to stir up war. So might US forces be behind these attacks? Or is it feasible that the Havana Syndrome doesn't exist at all? There are still some skeptics who believe the symptoms are psychosomatic, and that any corroborating concussions have been caused by previous trauma or mental triggers. The Havana Syndrome is one of the world's strangest modern day mysteries, and we may never know exactly what it is or exactly what is happening. Will its symptoms continue to spread? Will it be the future of warfare? Or is it really nothing at all? <laughs>